um, yeah, I'm going to start up here. But I just say one thing about, um, you know, what wisdom is. You know, wisdom is the knowledge of life, you know, and uh, the, the idea is uh, Sophia, and we're, we're going to learn about her, her too, you know, is the, uh, is the sum total of all archetypal contents, all patterns uh, that created uh, bodies, you know. I mean, so that's wisdom. You know, Sophia, she's, she's the wisdom that created bodies. And what other wisdom is there, really? I mean, if there were no bodies, there would be no or no life. There'd be just rocks, you know. So really, the, all this spiritual stuff, you know, is more about the meaning of wisdom, you know, of the wi meaning of the wisdom of the body. And yet we seem to be, you know, that the, you know, the sp spinning and the widening gyre, the falcon can't hear the falconer anymore. The, you know, the spirit can't hear the body or the ego can't hear the body or something like that. But I mean, it's becoming more and more. And, and you know, uh, like this one woman I worked with, who's the head of the programs at the Young Institute in Zurich. I mean, she's, she says that she, that too, that the self, you know, which is the archetype of fullness is in the body. You know, it has to do with the wisdom of the body, nothing else. So, I mean, doesn't that just make sense to you? I mean, it certainly makes sense to me because what other, what other spirit ghosty thing can you do with your consciousness? You know? I mean, other than be alive and experience the, uh, you know, the, the, inexhaustible energy of life invincible you know and you, you sort of wonder sometimes uh what, what the the uh, you know you're supposed to be the vessel of the incarnation of the patterns that uh, existed uh, I, I, we're gonna just go through this and but at nine uh or let's see uh, at the uh, with the last 15 minutes, wh wherever I am, I'm going to start on the uh, constellations uh, of the uh, of the archetypes, which uh, a couple of people said were a little difficult, but but I've actually had active imaginations on, on these before I even uh, started reading this, which is there isn't much you can skip, you know, and, and it, it really came down to this is that uh, I. Uh, you know, after I descend to the rock where the house, the temple of wisdom is built by going through the seven gates with the nana and just, uh, uh, you, you know, removing all outer garments, you know, until you're, you're there in, you're in your true self. And then I, I, I and the soul go down to the waterfront and uh, uh, there we find the woodpecker mother. She's the, she's the, uh, master of all woodpeckers and you know that woodpeckers are the uh, are the spirit birds of trees you know? i mean they never leave the tree that they're a bird they fly but they never leave the rooted thing and uh, she is is the goddess actually also of all manifested beings but then we get in a boat and we go across the bay and we come to uh Kind of a high bank and we go up and there's a very dark meadow and there exists Sophia and she's sitting there and no life has come into being yet and this is before life is created but yet and then you ask her what is on your mind mother what are you thinking about you know this is before life came you know, anyway, uh, this was a, sort of an uh, uh, active imagination I had even before I read this, which is, this just is so illuminating to it. Well, anyway, um, we're going to start, and hi, uh, Dahlia is here, you know, but we'll just pick up where we left off, and uh, it's, it's um, we really want to just discuss uh, the uh, swans, you know, and... Uh, you know, it was interesting that the king sends the uh, the children into uh, the unconscious. His, you know, newly developed uh, 
contents that are going to break up his his uh, uh, world of dry stones. He's trying to save it from the negative witch, so he sends them to the unconscious, which is very unusual in, in the fairy tale because the the king doesn't usually try to save Hansel and Gretel. You know, I mean, they he usually is uh, lets them go and then is unaware of them or something. But anyway, then they turn into the swans and the ravens, and so then you know uh, we'll just pick up in in the collective conscious situation that's the king this is where the feminine principle has disappeared in its positive form and has turned to evil you know the um the fact that the children the wonderful beings that are going to uh bring new life into the world have regressed but they've regressed into the instinctive realm you know a more undifferentiated you know they're animal forms but they're not just any animal forms. They're almost godlike animal forms. You know, the swan, this amazing bird, and uh, the raven, you know, is, is one of the smartest animals on the planet. You know, it's similar to the gray parrot. But anyway, uh, the, so the, and the only woman is the heroine, uh, and the daughter, and, or the sister, and a negative mother figure. Uh, the um, so the principle of feeling and of nature is no longer recognized in consciousness. It's, it's left, you know, and so she has to recover it, you know. And um, the the uh, consciousness is too masculine, too rational, and so uh, even in her, uh, so the underworld uh, reacts in this negative form. The negative mother principle then transforms forms the boys into swans and ravens. Now, uh, ra ravens and swans um, are both birds of Apollo and uh, are very similar. In the seven ravens, the father himself in a moment of rage pronounces the curse on his sons, not the stepmother. That's also interesting. The king sends his sons into the forest and, and you know, follows in the castle, follows this the cotton, magic cotton ball, the Ariadne thread to get to them because he is completely lost in the unconscious, you know? And in this case, uh, it's not the stepmother that curses them, but the father. And now the father's conscious ego uh, that was this uncontrolled affect. And now she goes through here too that, um, uh, Usually it is the male aspect, but in this case, the reason the father did it is because um, not, see, he did it because of his negative anima, this affect within him. His, he did not have a good relationship with the feminine within him. And so it came out as, uh, as, as, the, uh, as the devouring mother or the old witch, uh, which the stepmother was not here. And it, it, but it turns out to be the same in, in, in same thing. In the first story, the uh, negative feminine, femininity uh, came from the stepmother, but the stepmother, again, it wasn't her fault. It was the negative animus in her. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, the stepmother is not at fault. Neither is the father. It's, it's their negative relationship. The negative relationship of the mother to the masculine principle in herself and the negative relationship of the father principle with with the feminine in, in himself so it's the fact that, that 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 was the case in both cases but anyway he curses the children uh because they didn't bring uh the water uh to to baptize the sickly girl so it was connected with the christian problem of baptism you know, now baptism is older than Christianity. I mean, it existed before, you know, John the Baptist was there before Jesus. And it's an ancient uh, rite, basically. It's a symbol uh, that the consciousness is put in the depths all the way down and experiences a near death. You know, you're, you're actually supposed to be held down there until you almost drown. And then they bring you up and uh, you have to gasp when, when, they, when you reach air. 
you know, and it's this idea of that you're uniting with the depths, you know, but it's older than Christianity, but ba baptism guaranteed the child uh, the, um, uh, the uh, what they call the visio beati beatifica, beatifica, which is um, really the vision of God or the, the, the ability to connect directly with the unconscious, which is not really a very Christian, <laughs> it's more of a shamanic uh, really thing. So now the event is understood that the girls in the girl's fate, she is unlikely to become Christian. In, in terms of Christian consciousness, she's likely to go astray. And so the father uh, tries to force the old habits, the ones that don't work anymore on her. And in so doing, nature uh, rebels and uh, uh, the accident occurs. So it's parallel to the first story. The clinging of consciousness to the old principles and ways starts up the evil principles suddenly coming out of the dark side of the father. The dark side of the father is really his negative relationship to the feminine within him whose uncalled uh, for affect falls upon the principle of renewal, the boys. Now, the, the swan boys um, uh, come from, uh, the word swan refers to the singing swan, means sound. And you've heard of the swan song. That's the magical song that a swan sings as it dies, complaining bitterly and giving up high-pitched cry. It's supposed to be, those who've heard it, um, thought um, it was as it knows it's approaching death, as all birds do, and it's able to foretell uh, death and weathers and the future, all birds. And uh, because the swan was, knew the future, it was holy to Apollo and also to Nyodur, who the Norse uh, god. And of course, the, all the swan maidens, you know, Wotan swan maidens who went and, uh, you know, would, uh, the Valkyries were swan maidens, you know, would, would go uh, gather the dead on the battlefield, you know. Uh, this, and, uh, you, you know, the, uh, it often happens that, uh, and we read about this in Anima and Animus, the uh, Emma Young's book, that the, um, the, the hunter catches the, the swan maidens bathing, steals one of the feather garments. She has to follow him home. And then it's not good because uh, somehow uh, she it is very wild. She's a nature being and he's not capable of, of handling her, you know, and uh, she's, she's not been um, differentiated enough. And uh, now uh, the, um, Fairy folk often have swan, duck, or goose feet. You know, I mean, this was, uh, uh, is, uh, you know, this woman every night, the elves or the brownies would do all her housework and she never saw them. So one day she put flour on the floor so that she could the next morning see the tracks and they're all little duck feet, you know, but they never came back. You know, it was the idea of she's making them too literal. You know, uh, so vows are taken in the name of the swan. The swan is the spiritual aspect of, of, of the unconscious psyche. And like all birds represents intuition and hunches. And its skin is completely jet black. Its bill is jet black. Its feet are jet black. And yet it has the, uh, the, the feathers and down are the whitest snow. So it's this bird that's somewhat you know, uh, is, is, contains the opposites. Um, and uh, uh, so um, now, uh, so the, in the Swan Maiden stories, it's usually a question of how a man can get hold of his anima because it, uh, when it, he can't hold the Swan Maiden, he has to notice the moods and half unconscious thoughts that appear in the background of consciousness and, and hold on to them so they don't disappear. Or she's going to put back on her swan garments, which is our problem here, is, uh, is um, uh, 
redeeming the swan garments in the uh, boys. So, but the doing of the above, uh, so writing down his moods or thoughts, he takes the volatility away from the anima and gives it a human quality. You know, if the father had done this uh, with the, with the um, uh, who, who cursed the Raven boys, he would have been more conscious of his moods and had a little more distance from it. So uh, the, the writing down the mood or thought, he takes the volatility of the anima away and gives her a human quality, uh, not a swan quality. So during the uh, above though, uh, doing the above though is not enough to do it once. Even if a man has realized what the anima is, she will slip right back into her feather garment and fly out the window the one first day he starts to uh, forget her. The same is true of, of, of a woman. If they don't uh, watch their animus every day, it returns back to its old bird form. So a constant conscious effort is required to keep these inner entities, the animus bird and, and the swan maiden, uh, in their connection with human consciousness uh, because their tendency is to escape. And then you're just left in the world of dry stones all by yourself. I mean, the water of life uh, requires uh, you operate at a certain level, which is, is very foreign to us, directed thinking people. You know, we, we have to uh, uh, be in personality number two all the time. You know, personality number one is the one, the literal, our literal personality. Personality number two is the one uh, at, uh, at um, Bollingen. You know, Young, young uh, said that he would never, he, he could, would never write anything and he'd been at Bollingen for a week. You know, I mean, uh, because that's how long it took him to, to get rid of the stink of Kusnacht, you know. Uh, the stink of personality number one, and then the, then the anima won't is, won't leave him. She's uh, he's he's in a in a, in a state where she her tendency is not going to be to escape or fly away, because um, he's adopted to now. Remember too, Annette, you told us that story. Is is the only way that you could tame the swan maiden is to become a swan yourself. You know, you had to adapt to her world, not her to yours. So really, that is the secret of why they're so flighty. Why are they so flighty? It's because we're sitting around expecting to them to adopt to our world. When I, the problem is we need to adapt to their world, you know. Uh, so um, any, anyway, the, uh, the swan maiden was a pre-Christian companion of Wotan. And if is something uh, it is uh, that is already in human consciousness is forced into a swan garment, this means a regression. Content. This boys, the spirit of renewal, have 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 left life. They've regressed into the unconscious, and uh, uh, this is a deterioration uh, of the conscious attitude uh, 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 that was caused by the king in his uh, you know his bad attitude. And then, uh, you know, we, we did talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the wonderful uh, uh, underground movements of, of, the, of the courtly love and the grail lynching. Meister Eckhart and alchemy, you know, these three movements, which were full of, of the anima uh, and, and the feeling and eros principles you know, of, of the, uh, aspect of, of, of uh, now, now, I was trying to find out, Von Franz says in here, and I couldn't exactly find the quote, but, but she says that, that the uh, feminine world orients itself. Now we're talking about the feminine world, not woman. The feminine world orients itself or finds illumination or enlightenment through love and the feeling function and to heroes, where the masculine principle, and this is not man, uh, finds its enlightenment through logos and the thinking principle. So alchemy, uh, courtly love and the grail and Meister Eckhart were, um, you know, uh, 
were finding their illumination, not through spirit, but through love. And uh, um, now, there, they, of course, there was a, a, a reason, an evolutionary reason, uh, what she calls the demonic extroversion of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation and the Renaissance, was this rational development, this historical progress. Uh, but the anima, uh, in, the, in that case, the spirit of renewal was forced back into the unconscious. And the anima is... Uh, is forced back into her swan garment. So um, then we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to go until um, 1130, and then I want to talk about the uh, uh, the uh, constellating uh, aspect. Uh, uh, just and then we'll if I missed anything, we'll pick that up next time. But I just thought I, it had been mentioned. I think we should go over. So you know, um, the raven is was white. It was a light. Uh, bringer. He was, was like a Promethean figure, but was blackened by the fire when it brought it out. That's one. So he's a bird of white and black. And Apollo, he was white. Uh, Apollo's bird was white. Uh, uh, but um, he turned him black because um, Apollo had sent him to keep an eye on his wife. Uh, and she had an affair with Ischus. And he didn't, didn't stop the affair. You know, he just observed it. And then when he came back, he ratted her out or he was a tattletale. You know? And so that's why he was turned black. Now, uh, the, the raven or crow uh, is the mother of Asclepius, uh, who is the, uh, you know, the god of uh, healing on the island of Kos. Noah sent a raven out after the flood, but it was, it just fed on the corpses. And only the dove returned. And so the raven is more earthly than the dove. And it fed Elijah and St. John of Patmos. I don't know if you've ever seen the paintings of the ravens bringing the food to uh, the prophet Elijah and St. John of Patmos. Uh, and, and now the word for white is shining, which is also the word for black. And it refers to the secret identity of the opposites. The raven is dark thoughts, but is also a sudden illuminations, illuminations. So it's related to the light principle, but it's also related to dark thoughts. And uh, birds generally are uh, these, um, a, a, a light on our heads. We think we possess them, but they just um, come to us. And uh, uh, they're a pre-conscious awareness of something. And to catch a thought, is uh, to um, is is to bring it into a critical assessment and something I got to remember this you know now that is catching a thought now hey, now this is this is a, a beautiful little thing I didn't want to skip this but um, in in dreams ravens generally appear as melancholy uh, melancholy sad thoughts uh, and paintings of depressed people show dark woods stormy seas, blackbirds everywhere. And it refers to sad, depressing thoughts one has in such a condition. I am nobody and I will never get better. But the raven is also God's messenger. And uh, the, the, these depressions are meant to be, unite us with the divine principle. They're creative. And if you admit those black thoughts, you say, yes, perhaps I am nobody, but in what sense? You know, now you've got a distance from the black thoughts and you have a dialogue with them. And the de depression is, is um, best overcome by going into it and not fighting it. And, uh, you know, Young had this, Patient who had this wonderful dream. I just want to share real quick. Is uh, this one here? Uh, she uh, was commanded to descend into a pit filled with hot stuff and immerse herself in it. This she did till only one shoulder was sticking out of 
the pit. Then Young came to her in her dream and pushed her in to the hot stuff, exclaiming, not out, but through. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to pull you out of that. You need to go through it yourself. You know, so so that's the idea of that the depression is is really uniting us with the divine principle. As long as, you know, it's it's not something that is, you know, related to some chemical imbalance or actually a psychosis, a real psychosis, you know. Uh, so, and, and, and trying to escape it through mindless television, social media, doesn't improve it. Sex, you know, whatever, it only makes it worse. And it's much letter, better to let such black thoughts uh, come up and to dialogue with them. And uh, then very often they become the bread bringers. But they don't bring you the common bread. You know, they, they, uh, you know, you know some woman, some, uh, she was a janitor and uh, she came to see Young. And he said to her, she was uneducated, just was a janitor. And he says, have you read my books? And she says, your books aren't books. She says, they're bread. Yeah. And so uh, these um, can be the bread bringers, these uh, um, uh, dark contents, and they connect us with God. And a, depres a depression is really meant to connect one with the divine principle. So uh, depressing thoughts. Now remember, what's the opposite of depressing thoughts? Inflation, <laughs> okay? Now what is inflation? That means you're a big balloon and one pin can pop you, you know? And uh, uh, Young has this wonderful thing is that you, you can't be too good or the devil will hate you and you can't be too bad or uh, or God will hate you. So he says it's better to just be in the middle. You know, I mean, you would you walk the tightrope. You know, you don't try to be saintly or, or you don't try to be a, a thief. You know, uh, but um, it so the depressing thoughts behind the, the divine bread, the depressing thoughts behind the divine bread that comes to us from from the depression, which is the image. You know, and, and this, this is, remember this too. Uh, the unconscious is uh, like sending us nightmares, sometimes sends us, it, 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 it's, uh, you know, fate is not devilish, it's elfin. You know, it's, uh, it is trying to get us to uh, do what we learn about the crown chakra. You know, uh, I don't know if anyone heard the uh, crown chakra, uh, but, you know, you know the, uh, the, 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 the blockage there is attachment, you know, so you need, it. And, and the music in there too, uh, Gary, was somewhat connected with death, you know, I mean, there was just an aspect, but I, I thought it was sublime, you know, as well, but uh, no personal sorrow, this is Young said, is, is too great that it can't be dissolved in an eternal image. The images are healing, you know, and uh, so so any great pain or great suffering in us also awakes the healing principle within us. You know, if, if the healing principle is awoken when we experience great suffering. So um, anyway, uh, this taking up the connection with the swan maiden. Uh, means a possibility for a man to develop his eros. Uh, well, well I, I just left up one, one thing, um, that um, the depressing thoughts uh, bring the divine bread, the image, uh, which it explains why the raven has a, such a strange double aspect in myth. Rational consciousness needs to be dimmed by a depression. It needs to, we need to find out that our Un, uh, our all-powerful king of, of ego has no power at all. You know, and it needs to be dimmed by the depression in order that the new renewing light may be found. 
Now remember the renewing light in this fairy tale, uh, he hid in the unconscious, trying to hide it from the fact that he, he, he was uh, not connected with the feminine. He had a bad connection with his own anima, anima within him. So uh, anyway, uh, the, when you take a, a man takes up a connection with a swan maiden, it means that there's a po possibility in him to develop his eros. But here, the woman takes up uh, contact with the swan and raven brothers. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Uh, there are her brothers, but she takes up contact. And so the heroine has taken up connecting with officially rejected thoughts. Now, a woman's mind is usually closer to nature, but both negatively and positively. Now, in the average world of present science, what is generally rejected in the average world of present science um, is uh, uh, often picked up by those people who don't overvalue uh, press and science. And that tends to be uh, the feminine mind. They don't overvalue uh, science or the mind. And so they have an advantage of being freer and more flexible. Remember also too, that uh, the principle of enlightenment in the feminine world is uh, love and feeling, not uh, logos. And I just wanted to show you this. This is incomplete, but I would like to uh, make it even more complete. I mean, these are some of the women in Young's life. You know, I mean, it, the ones that, that followed him, you know, at uh, first there was his mother, his sister Gertrude, and uh, Aileen Pricework, uh, uh, Emma Young, who was an analyst herself, uh, Sabrina Spillrein, uh, Tony Wolf, uh, Carrie Baines, who was one of his most trusted, Christiana Morgan, who I think he had a big crush on, and uh, uh, Olga Frulda uh, Capit. She's the, uh, uh, the, the subject of, of the book of the uh, vision seminars, which to me are like reading uh, The Lord of the Rings. You know, it's, it's, just, it's an experience. It's not a reading, it's just an experience. Olga Fruba uh, Capitan, who was uh, uh, the founder of Iranos. Uh, there's uh, uh, Barbara Hanna, and then uh, Marie Louise von Franz. Now this is uh, Mary Mellon. And uh, this is the, uh, the uh, a relative of the Kaiser. She's a princess. She's a Hohenzollern. <laughs> uh, but she was at, at all the uh, uh, things. There's, there's uh, now that's uh, um, uh, uh, the, the one, her, her uh, she, she, she's at the, the largest um, ranch in San Francisco. I, I'm trying to remember her name. But she married uh, uh, um, uh, a, a young analyst, but she's very good. And there is his companion on his trip to Africa. I kind of drawn a blank on the names. This is uh, um, uh, the Elizabeth uh, Harding, Esther Harding. And then that's um, Anyela Yaffe. And uh, this was his secretary for a long, long time. And uh, um, now the other ones, I'm uh, that this is uh, uh, Hilda Kirsch, uh, and then Yolanda Jacobi, who founded the uh, Young Institute, and then um, uh, Lillian Fryron is on the lower right hand corner. But there's a lot of other ones. I mean, one of the really good ones there was Linda Fears David. Uh, she's not listed there. Her picture, like I'd like to update her. But anyway, um, that is, um, there's a little bit more in here uh, that will, uh, maybe we can pick it up next time, but I'd like to skip uh, just in the last 15 minutes to, uh, this is just the start of the lecture nine. And uh, it's about the um, archetypes, you know, about the uh, star flowers, okay? You know, she makes that, she's going to cure the, the swan garments, the swan shirts, with uh, a shirt made out of star flowers. Now, it's not a shirt made out of stars. It's not a shirt made out of flowers. 
which she could have done either one. It's a shirt made out of star flowers, you know, uh, the flowers representing the, the feeling function, you know, and, and the stars representing the illumination through the feeling function. That this is women's, woman's or feminine uh, principle of of enlightenment is in is in love, eros, and feeling function. That was one thing Lillian Fryron said that if Jung had been a woman, that he would have talked much, much more about love. But see, the principle of enlightenment in Jung, as, as someone who is related more to the masculine principle, was uh, the, the spiritus, uh, logos, and thinking, you know, and uh, differentiation, you know, and taking things apart and not bringing them together. Although he was very good at the, at the other side too, you know. But anyway, uh, this is just the start of chapter nine. And uh, before the brothers became birds, they were adolescents, okay? And in feminine psychology, a boy represents honest enterprise, an impulse towards active life, straightforward or naive, I mean, close to nature, ideas, you know, not conceptual ideas. So uh, honest enterprise, the boy, the, the adolescent, you know, feminine psychology, that boy uh, represents honest enterprise, impulse towards active life, straightforward and naive ideas. This is sort of her psychopompos. This is her guide, you know, is, is into the outer world or to the inner world. And, uh, uh, but through the activity of the witch, the negative mother, uh, this part of the young woman has been reduced uh, and, 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 and become unconscious in uh, swan shirts and raven shirts. And, uh, and so uh, it has been reduced to swans and ravens, which are otherworldly and melancholy fantasies. So her honest enterprise impulse towards active life and straightforward naive ideas has been regressed into other world melancholy fantasies. So the brothers need a star flower shirt in order to return to the human realm and so that she can redeem uh, the uh, adolescent boy within her. Now, um, the... Uh, uh, now, the, these contents, uh, the boys, they could be uh, contents of a more spiritual nature, or they could be emotional, unconscious thoughts, which need to be expressed in a humanly adequate manner. So the, the idea of, of, the, of, the, of these um, uh, unconscious contents that are represented by the boys or by the boys and the swan maidens are either spir uh, spiritual nature or um, expressing unconscious thoughts in a humanly adequate manner. And we're going to find this out later. I'm I am horrible at, at expressing emotions in a humanly <laughs> adequate manner. I just generally avoid them, you know. But um, now they normally are both for emotion. Uh, usually, uh, also contains a symbolic idea. Anger, sadness, contains a, a symbolic idea. So um, a, a thought which comes from the unconscious generally contend, contains a tremendous amount of, mo of emotion. Now, the material for the shirts is made from star flowers. They grow in the woods on a leafless stem. They're very simple, uh, star-like flowers. Um, and uh, they, they grow under a tree where the sun shines. So now they would suggest a star that fell into uh, the forest, but that's not what they are. Uh, they've grown up from below. Uh, here first is the uh, star flowers. These are stars. Now, this is what she's gonna make the shirts out of. Stars and flowers, stars that are flowers. Now, uh, they come up from below, though. They don't fall from the heavens. So this is the heavens below that we uh, uh, 
um, hear about. And uh, um, Jung uh, has this wonderful uh, aspect. Of, now, this is from the Emerald Tablets. It rises from the earth to the skies. Here again, we find the curious process of development, which is opposed to the other conceptions, where the redeemers almost invariably, the stars, come down from heaven. But here, the movement goes from nature up into the spiritual realm of heaven and descends again onto the earth, gathering strength of both into itself. So this is the idea of the heavens below. The stars, the heavens come from the depths from the earth. And this is, this is how she's going. This is how the woman or the feminine is going to uh, solve this problem. So uh, the mo motif of the star coming from below is, is of utmost importance in alchemical thinking. Uh, this is um, in, from Gerhard Dorn, uh, who it talks about the heavens below. And, uh, you know, he, um, the ultimate union with the whole cosmic nature comes when the heavens below have been produced by the alchemist. And he's united with what's called the unis mundus, which means one world or the cosmic divine nature. So what is the unus mundus, okay? Because um, we experience the unus mundus all the time. But I, I first uh, told you about it in, in uh, this active imagination where we leave the realm of manifest life. We go across the uh, sea, come to the other side where there is no life. And there sits Sophia, you know, who's the sum total of all uh archetypal patterns that created all flowers, all insects, all flowers. And she's sitting there. And then you ask her, what is on your mind, mother? You know, th this, is, this is the unus mundus. She, Sophia, is the unus mundus. And uh, so before creation, there was a conception of it. Before there were flowers, bodies, and us, and you and me, there was a conception of it. You could, how else did it come into being? That, you know, there's this idea of neg entropy, you know, which means an improbable state of order. You know, entropy is where everything, uh, you know, goes down to the, if you let, lo, left the universe long enough, uh, it, it would all become the same temperature. Everything would be the same temperature. You know, there wouldn't be hot stars and cold space. Everything would be the same temperature, you know. Uh, but neg entropy is the exact opposite. Ne everything doesn't come down. Everything rises to an improbable state of order. You know, and this is what Ed Edward Edinger says, that our consciousness is the great miracle of the universe. And if you don't know that, then you haven't uh, been in awakened, you know, because it's absolutely impossible, you know. Every time Rabbi Zeus here realized he was alive, he fainted in disbelief. That's how we should all live, you know. So uh, before creation, there was a conception of it. A structure existed before building, uh, before bodies came into being. Now, this, this also is going to describe, too, uh, what, what our constellated pattern is, too. We want to know what our dreams tell us about our constellation. Because life has a constellation, so do we, you know. So uh, this, don't think this only applies to, uh, to the universe. It applies to us too. So uh, the unus mundus is the sum total of all the pre-existing structural patterns. And it's identified with the feminine, the archetypal figure of Sophia, the wisdom of God. But she's also really is the wisdom of nature and the wisdom of bodies, wisdom of all life. I don't know what else she is the wisdom of. Uh, the, but the types or archetypal forms, this potential divine world is the unis mundus, the one undivided whole cosmos. Now this, it, this undivided whole cosmos doesn't appear, uh, is the potential, the latent potential. Now, there is a latent potential in you, and it's the unconscious. 
and it has not unfolded. Now, in, in, in the creation of the universe, there was these seeds in Sophia, you know, who created flowers and, and bees and, uh, uh, and bunnies and fish and snakes and all living things. There were the seeds in Sophia that created these, you know. Uh, I, I one time walked through the, uh, one of the great spiritual religious experiences of my life was to walk through Shedd's Aquarium in Chicago and go through the seahorse exhibit and see the seaweed seahorse. There is a seahorse there that lives in seaweeds and growing out of its body is the exact same weed that it lives in. You know, it's just perfectly camouflaged, you know. It's, it's just, it really, uh, this uh, seed of unflowering within it. So uh, the, by the unus mundus is expressed the idea that the multiplicity of life forms came into existence by the unfolding of these archetypes. Uh, and, and before this unfolding, there was no life. The, uh, the universe, the unfolded, um, folding of these archetypes. Uh, is 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 in matter was expressed in life forms. So the archetypal basis that underlies all life forms is the dimension of uh, uh, which the alchemist wants to unite with. So he doesn't want to unite. He's not a pantheist. He doesn't want to unite with the physical, uh, literal world. He wants to uh, unite with the archetypal world that lies behind all life. That's what he calls the unus mundus. Now, in, in Taoism, it's, it's very similar uh, that, um, that uh, you, you, uh, want to live, you want to live in harmony with the seeds that lie behind reality, not the literal reality. And it's in hexagram 16, firm as a rock uh, or the philosopher's stone, the wise man lives out of the seed and acts at once, lives out of the... Uh, of the uh, seeds that lie behind reality, not the literal reality. So he somewhat knows what's going to happen before it happens, acts at once. So by knowing the seeds, he's capable of realizing what's going on behind, and then he can act uh, with that knowledge and give them a better turn or creative expression. And in connection with the world, uh, behind the world, he recognizes the seeds and acts at once. Um, now, the, the, I, I just want to, I'm going a little bit over, but I just want to, uh, you know, the, the constellation, you know, we're talking about the star flowers, um, the, uh, the, so that whenever, sometimes some things happen, synchronistic things, and we say now the problem has been constellated, you know, and she says that we know what that means vaguely, but it is very mysterious. And uh, um, so um, the, the, uh, idea here is um, that the archetype implies order, arrangement, pattern. And from these, we can see uh, what the thing is driving at. So the dreams also have the unus mundus in it, this, uh, the seeds in it. And it's really the unfolding of, of uh, the rhizome, the root. See, that's, that's our sickness. Now, that's the sickness that grizzly bears don't have. They become grizzly bears because their, their seeds have no impediment, don't have an ego uh, uh, impeding their, their flowering. So the, this, um, the, the idea here is uh, also to, and I'm just gonna finish uh, that, um, uh, she, she sews the shirts uh, with the purpose of redeeming her brothers from their swan shape, shape giving them a human way of expression. And we're going to talk about what human ways of expression is because I didn't really know until I wrote this. I didn't know what human ways of expression is. But, but the, uh, the flower in general has to do with feeling. We use them to express feeling at births, marriages, and funerals. And the roses symbolize love, eros. And instead of using the stars from heaven that came, fell from heaven, she used the ones that, that came up from below. She could have done the same with stones or she could have just used flowers. 
that she used star flowers points to the feminine need for the feeling realization of the archetypal stars or the archetypal constellations. She, you know, this my my problem, my most intuitive problem is they have no sensate way of realizing their intuitions. And, and in her case, she she has no, she can't realize the stars through thinking because it's foreign to her. It's, it's, it is uh, unbelievably inhuman and dry and she re rebels from it. She needs to, uh, uh, to realize the constellations, the archetypal constellations through the medium of the flowers, through the medium of the feeling function. And uh, uh, for uh, in women, realization or from feminine principle, realization takes place via feeling. Enlightenment comes to her through the feeling realm. Okay, well, that's uh, uh, pretty much the, uh, I, I wanted to not skip, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of pick up on what we lost, but I uh, left out, but I just wanted to uh, ex uh, present that little thing because uh, we'd talked about it a little bit in other places. But uh, Anyway, Gary, sorry, I went over a little bit. Do you wanna- Oh yeah, so actually I wanted to start with Diane first because she did have her hand up for a while. I don't know if there's still a question or, did you have a question, Diane? You can also just break in, you know, because I'm oh, and you're I'm muted. oblivious. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly material that can create a lot of questions. Yeah. Hey, Diane, uh, did you have a question, or who had the question? Um, I, I think oh, yeah. Dahlia had her hand up, not me. Can you hear me now? I'm yeah. my um, microphone's not working on my Zoom, and that's why I'm 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 I've got both my iPhone and my um, um, laptop open, but so that's what the confusion I was having. Oh, but okay. I didn't I didn't have my hand up, but I'll be happy. Dahlia, did you ha have your hand up? I thought no. Okay, so I'll just share now. Anyway, I didn't really have my hand up, but um, I was just thinking that I, through this, actually I followed, I just recently joined the group, but I followed all of, almost all of these fairy tales through YouTube. So I feel like progressively, and also because I'm actually with the group and I have access to all of the other information that's not just available on YouTube, um, that this is really um, awakening in me episodes in my life that I can see have come from archety archetypes. And that, because as a female, I think that uh, the feminine archetypes have not been so well expressed in other union um, books from different writers. And um, Marie Louise Front France is doing an excellent, excellent job of this. And I'm also, um, I think it's been years ago, back in the 80s, that I did a course um, at the Jung Institute in, Union, in um, Houston uh, on a book by, uh, I think her name is Christy Pinkola Estes, The Women Who Run With Wolves. And um, so I'm reading a little bit ahead. I, I just want to say that this eight and nine, I know that Aline and Azine had uh, shared communication over the email and I didn't get a chance to uh, second, all of their expression about what was happening, how deep these last two um, chapters are. And, th and then I got so excited, I started reading ahead and, and chapter 10, and that's um, Wasilisa, the, the fairy tale of Wasilisa. And that, I know that, that that fairy tale was covered in uh, The Women Who Run With the Wolves. So I don't remember well, it's been so many years ago, 
but I'm very excited about these last chapters and that's what I'd like to share with you today. Thank you. Well put. Aline, would you uh, like to go next? There we go. Um, yeah, it, this brings up, you know, for me, you know, all this unconscious exploration and um, the feminine principle of the anima and the animus. It just brings up for me so much uh, my time uh, when I was a therapist and I did sand tray therapy because you use archetypal figurines for the client to dredge up all of their unconscious stuff, shadow if they can, and resolve it for themselves. I, I just provide the materials really and the, you know, um, the ground of their being and reflect back to them what I see and what I think it means and what is the, what they think it means. And so this just makes me feel so deep that in my process that I had all those years. And it's like, well, I'm still doing the same work, you know, parallel. We called it back then parallel process and um, participation mystique to us in sand tray therapy meant that you had your own process going on of your own life while your uh, client was talking, you know, so that's, that's what it just brings me back deep in that. And then I remembered when I retired, I kind of retired because I kind of lost uh, confidence in um, therapy, doing therapy for other people. It really didn't work, blah, blah, blah. You know, I kind of got disenchanted and I took up Gurdjieff, which explained the universe to me in a very logic way. And that was fun. And so now I'm into Jung again, and it's, um, well, I, I had a, I've had a diversion into meditation where we talk about consciousness all the time and how the self isn't real. So there's just a lot of forces going on around me, and I'm happy to be swimming in it. So thank you, guys. Thank you. That was great. Annette? Hi, Eileen. Thank you. Yeah, I, something similar to what you were saying. I recognize it a lot. And I actually had a couple of days ago, I had a dream about a new feminine figure. And I think it is really connected to reading these fairy tales and all this, what you are sharing, you know. And, um, but it, it, I suppose it goes too far to go <laughs> deeply into the dream, but I can type it up if, if you want to. And, um, but it was very, um, yeah, it, it, it really, I'm still puzzled by it and working on it and painting it and all of that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank oh, you, you don't want to, you could tell us the dream. I'd be curious to hear. Really? Yeah? Sure. You, you don't mind? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I was in an old house in a cottage, which we had before. It was kind of a very old house, you know, like the old houses in Ireland. And um, it had all earth colors on the inside beautiful earth colors now and uh, not not in my time but in the dream it had all these beautiful earth colors and it had these little um chambers in the hall in, in 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 the walls you know with terracotta statues and um but anyway i met a a, a friend who I, later on i associated her as a priestess which would have been a new figure in my dream you know i've never encountered priestesses in my dream which i i directly relate here to the fairy tales and uh because uh, so many times the, the the feminine is is highlighted as the wisdom as sophia and so on you know but anyway um this person said that uh, in my dream, she was not me, she was another person. And I was walking around and she had two little dogs. And anyway, um, the owner of the house uh, was criticizing the dogs a little bit, but anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But the whole message went to, um, there was another friend present and the priestess type said to me and to this other friend, um, well, you've chosen poverty, but that's a good thing. That basically was her message to me. And uh, when I woke up, then I thought, of course, she means poverty from the heart. And um, and in a way, I was just I was just going through a process that I should actually. I was just thinking, oh, I should go back to college again. I uh, I should get 
you know, more of a career and, uh, you know, I'm only working part time at the moment and and more or less the message of this dream was to to keep life simple, that by keeping it simple, I might connect to a deeper layer to this, perhaps this earth layer in me and that it is all about grounding and keeping things very simple and um, not into um, you know, um, developing more or going back to st study again. And um, and this friend, which was also present, is actually sick at the moment. And he is really a wounded healer. And he's healed many others. But now he's quite sick himself. And he lives in Italy. And he now has to heal himself first before he can do any healing on anybody else, you know. And... It felt also like he has to live in this more or less poverty that he's not um, having a whole uh, scene of clients and so on. He, he has to work on himself, you know, and heal himself. And, and Italy is full of earth colors, you know, beautiful Italy life. And uh, yeah, and so that's, and, and all, almost like that I had to be confined to, um, to, to simplicity to, and for me in order to grow and to go deeper and to connect to the earth the life has to become simple I can't uh, keep on um, going back to colleges and stuff like that <laughs> yeah that's how it, but if other people feel something different you know tell me you know <laughs> Yeah, beautiful dream. You know, I wish there wasn't six hours difference and that you could bring it to the dream group. That'd definitely be one to that would be fun to work with and to, you know, try try all the different amplifications we could figure out. Oh yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, I, I can maybe I can stay up one night and, and yeah. see. We, we, we can do a we can do a special session sometime too. Uh, oh, thank you. You know, that's that's more, but I, I just want to repeat what she says. Well, you've chosen poverty. That's a good thing. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? I, I mean, it just, uh, who, who was, who just kind of uh, was stunned by that statement? I mean, you could tell that's, uh, that is a authentic, genuine statement. <laughs> Can I say something to that? Because I was thinking that, isn't there something in the Bible where they say that to, for the poor, everything shall come, or something. Mm. Oh yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Bless, yeah. Blessed are the poor, so, because they'll inherit the earth. Well, I mean, it's the yeah. beatitudes or the yeah, I don't know, yeah, someone yeah. on the mountain or whatever. Mm. Well, Camille, you're, you're on. Why don't you go ahead and, and give us your thoughts? Well, I seem to have stage fright these weeks because <laughs> when I come to have something to say, it's like I don't. It's like when you ask uh, in the beginning, how are you? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, and there is some noise. Yeah. Do you think someone else can go in oh, just sure. now? Because uh, I have Dahlia. someone in the room and it confuses me. Yeah, Dahlia, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just, yeah, I need to... Yeah, to to um, uh, actually, I'll start. I I remember I bought very impulsively some old Lithuanian fairy tale book a couple months ago, and I was like, and I have very difficult. It's very difficult to to read it because I have an impression the closer you go to to your I don't know to your home, the more the the more difficult it gets. And um, there's also, I remember we have, um, there used to be um, a version of the, uh, of the fairy tale uh, with uh, seven ravens, I think it's original. And um, I remember an animation from my childhood. There's a version with 12 ravens. And, um, and there's very, um, interesting uh, that in that um, fairy tale the the girl she makes uh, the the clothes from stinging nettle and that's that's something uh, i know um it 
it made me think about also that it, it has to be connected to the feeling function and to the body and then to the muscle and then to the, that it stings or you, or you have to work it with your hands in order to make a body I know, or to, to materialize things. Or that's something extra, like it's not from this fairy tale, but it's something different, different. So I could share if you're interested, the, I think I can find it on YouTube, but it's already an, an old animation. So it can oh, sure. bring some other maybe ideas so so yeah you could either email it or put it up in the chat either one would work yeah i'll do it by email but okay. uh, yes i think it's it gives some food for thought also like what because she has to do it with her hands and uh, yeah that some different qualities to the also star flower why star flower i know it's very yeah, have a mirror. Uh, you need some time to think, but it's yeah. <laughs> I think I'll. I'll, I'll Dalia, was that. this? Uh, did you say this was a Lithuanian uh, uh, book of fairy tales or a Baltic region? I, or what? I think why why it was Russian. I think oh, originally Russian. Russian, but we like had it also in Lithuanian. So I'm not sure which. But I need to check. I can find it and maybe give some more information. Yeah, send that out as well. That'd be that'd be great to see. Yeah, sure. Cool. Azim? Hmm. Hi, everybody. So yeah, last week um, when I was thinking about if these two stories are originated somewhere else, I googled it. And uh, it was really interesting that uh, in different countries, uh, the birds are different. Sometimes they're peacock, dogs and stuff. I mean, um, um, I, I think Lithuanian, it's just, um, I, I can't find it what the bird is, but in Estony, uh, they give this um, fairy tale a number. And then they say in Estonia, it has like 30 different versions of this. So it's, this is a very, um, um, like geographically, um, it's all over Europe. And it's very interesting for those who want to follow um, the, um, the growth of a fairy tale, to see how it changes in different countries uh, in, in relation to the culture and stuff. So that's a very interesting uh, thing to know. Also, I was thinking maybe at the end of this um, sessions, um, at the end of this book, I can also give a presentation on one um, Persian myth that I use um, for leadership, but it's a very interesting, beautiful um, myth. It's about, it's called the canticle of the birds. Some of you might have heard it, but it's a really beautiful uh, myth. So I can share that with you. I can share my article and just talk oh, about great. it. Yeah. And if other people from different cultures, countries, um, just want to make an effort to um, see these tales through the lens of depth psychology and symbology, it would be great to do that. So in regards to this book, I was having the time of my life that um, lecture nine, I was like immersed, completely immersed in the context and for three days. Um, so it's really interesting how she describes this um, creation and the work of magician or alchemist. And she describes that the alchemist um, makes unity gets integrated with the uh, our, our God's idea, the united archetypal Mosolic uh, idea that God had uh, before creation. And then in Taoism, they get united with these particles, these constellations, which are nothing, there are no thing 
but they have they have all the potentiality for become everything, but they're nothing. They're just potential. They're just constellations of energy in a soup. So that's the always um, the superior man is united with. And then she talks about pantheism, uh, who in pantheism, we get united with the manifested multiplication uh, of this idea that is now manifested in physical work. So it's interesting, if you remember Craig uh, from the dream session, I had a vision last week. And in this vision, there were two memories of my childhood from when I was an infant and when I was two, three years old. And the idea of writing a book about um, when I was a Muslim. And then these two versions, I knew when I woke up, when I get conscious, I knew that the first memory is related to my religious experience of unity. And the second one is related to the encounter with the self, which is as an atheist or agnostic I experience. And reading this chapter, it made me realize why. Because at the first vision, vision I was in God um, idea. I was, I was an infant. I was one with the God idea, just this total archetypal idea. And then in the second one, which I recognized myself and I felt um, differentiated with the dog and my hand, just the physical manifestations, it was in the realm of pantheism. And my encounter with the self experiences that I had a couple of them uh, three, four years ago, it was encounter with the self and it was a pantheist approach to this unit. So it's really, really interesting um, uh, idea. And I, I'm just totally immersed in it trying to, uh, my brain is making connections. So it's really interesting for me. And the one thing that I wanna share was about um, when she says these constellations, if they're nothing yet, you can change it, you can participate, you can co-create. The um, alchemist or magician can do that. But when it's manifested as something evil or good, you cannot do anything because it's already manifested. So I was thinking that in this constellation, there's no positive and there's no negative because energy as um, mistakenly we, call, we keep telling that this is negative energy, this is positive negative energy. Energy is um, scholar, so it's not positive or negative. Force can be negative and positive. So the moment it starts becoming, when it, the energy starts doing something that becomes force, in that transition, it's in that moment that you can interfere because it's manifesting in something good or bad. So that's when the magician just grabs it uh, and turn it um, to something that is co-created with the, uh, the whole trust. Very interesting subjects. And it's um, in my personal life, I mean, uh, I'm experiencing the magician archetype and um, I, I can see how, it, how easily it can turn into destruction because destroyer and creator are the same archetype. So it's really interesting idea and it's really fascinating to see it unfold in reality, you know, how it, how it is working. I'm very curious about this process. You know, just a, a quick question. That was just beautiful, but I, I just wanted your opinion on this. When the king turns his sons into, you know, into the ravens, he almost sounds like a magician at that point. You yeah. Know? And had Black he had a positive, magic. you know, then he could have done something good. And I think uttering that word is the is the act of manifestation. It's when the energy becomes the force and it becomes negative. Yeah. And he's unconscious because the animal, the negative animal talks through him. 
and just manifest this um, energy into negativity and yes. possession. Can I ask you something, Azim? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, what I'm just thinking of now is that it reminds me in astrology of the the way Mars energy can be used for both good and bad. You know, Mars energy is often very much into action and into uh, getting, you know, getting ready, like uh, shooting from the hip almost like the thing. And uh, it, so it can be used, um, if it's used unconsciously, um, it, it can be destructive, but as a musician, it looks like you have great, great responsibility to become conscious. It's true it's, about it's every archetype. Every archetype at the beginning is possessive and negative and primitive. Then you start living it and you make it conscious and it gives you the gifts. Mm -hmm. So for every archetype, everything, and you know that every human experience can become, um, if it's constellated enough, it can become a pattern or an archetype. So with yeah. everything, it just, and this is what Jung says, that humans, the, the main task of being a human is making unconscious conscious. So that's basically yeah. our job, to co-create. Yes, yes. But I was just wondering, in what relation do you see that with the magician, specifically with the magician? Do you see that as a... Uh, that a magician has an extra responsibility because he's directly creating or...? Well, magician archetype, um, at first we think that we are going to that level and we are mm -hmm. starting to co-create, but um, little by little we realize that we have always been doing that. But mm. when we came to this level of um, archetypal, experiencing archetypal magician, uh, we are more aware. Yeah. So you can say that it comes with responsibility, realizing that you're responsible, not just becoming responsible. Okay. But we have always yeah. been doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, fascinating as always, Azim. Um, Camilla, do you have something to say now? <laughs> Thank you. I was just, uh, it, this is not where, where I thought I would go, but I was just thinking about something you said, Azim, about the archetypes, archetypes always are negative. And um, I was wondering if they aren't really neutral in one way until we cancellate patterns that craves them to become conscious, that's when they become kind of problematic. Or if they are negative, is it then in the same way as, for example, you have a negative in an old fashioned photograph that they are not yet sort of, um, yeah, they haven't taken a shape that we recognize in light or but I was I was just thinking that the archetypes by and of themselves, are they really negative? No, they're not negative. What I said was that at the beginning, when you start to experience an archetype, because they're deep in the unconscious. Mm -hmm. For example, for example, my warrior archetype, I haven't experienced warrior. It's been down in the um, deep in the unconscious. And archetypes are not energy. They are patterns mm -hmm. that let the libido energy go through them and they give shape mm -hmm. to this energy. Like when you're experiencing Mars, the libido tends to be defensive and war and assertiveness or goal orientation, this, this kind. When it goes through Venus, it's sexual and passion and beauty. Okay, so it's manifestations of the energy, but they are not energy. So first they are very deep in the unconscious. Then at some point your ego is capable of receiving this energy. So they start coming up to the surface of consciousness. But what you first experience is the negative side of them because you cannot uh, channel the energy. Ego is not ready to receive the gifts. So we ex usually we experience the negative side. Like with animal animals, animals, they're always primitive, they're always possessive. 
And then uh, I have a theory that it goes, um, it, it comes to a level that it projects and then it um, manifests. So we call it living that archetype. So it's not about the archetype. The archetype is not negative. The ego is, the way ego is perceiving the archetype and this energy, because it's not ready to receive the gifts, it becomes possessive. Possession means that ego cannot handle it. It's overwhelmed by this energy. So you start um, acting weird because you cannot <laughs> handle the energy. That's what that, and you, you use a very beautiful analogy about uh, negative in photography. It's the same thing as, posit, uh, in, as in positive image, you know, but it hasn't still manifested mm. the right way. Beautiful. Indeed. Mm. The alchemical emblems, they'll show it first is a dragon, then it becomes a stag, then it becomes a unicorn. And then it becomes the king's son. But go ahead, Pamela, mm. I'm sorry. No, go it's ahead. okay. It's fine. It's interesting, all of it. Well, it made me think that was some of the text, and now I can't remember what she wrote about it, but she mentioned the hair. And some months ago, I had um, a dream as well, which was um, I was in my old school, sort of, which has different extensions to the right, this building. And in the top was the number A, and that's where all the younger classes were. And then number the B sort of area was uh, third and fourth grade, etc. And I was somewhere sort of along fourth or fifth grade. And I was then bitten on my right hand by this hair. And uh, I've been puzzling over it for months. I mean, when I was a little girl, about seven, I had... Uh, children's uh, juvenile, juvenile rheumatism and it took them a long time to figure it out about sort of four years and that sort of goes along with the time that um, the hair bit me if you like but it's also interesting um, so you see I've had a long life with sort of trying to go towards this illness as we would an archetype so I haven't taken medicine for it for um, a long, long, long time. And um, I've tried to sort of work with the pain as if it was like an unconscious symptom. And then before Christmas, this dream came up um, with the hair biting my hand. And I don't think, I don't recall dreams that in that sense have sort of spoken about something feminine which I experienced the hair as, but I would be, I would love to hear feedbacks on this. Um, but since Maria Louise from France mentions it in this context, I was thinking of it as well, um, that it's somehow an imbalance or something going on between the masculine and the feminine, obviously, since it was my right hand. And that's also where the rheumatism started. I had these sort of inflammatory attacks in my right, in my right hand and, Later, these hands of mine have been, you know, very, very important, both in my sort of physical um, artistic work, but also as a writer. Um, and yeah, so this is what I've been trying to think. I can't really think myself out of it or as you know, but um, I wanted to articulate this without really having uh, reached uh, a thought. I thought this could be interesting to see if some feelings or intuitions came up from, from speaking about it in this context. Thank you. I'd like to do, I'd like to do some research on it, definitely, Camilla. Uh, it's the, uh, she, she also, the hair is a rabbit, you know, in case uh -huh. not everyone, knew. you know, a rabbit. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, do you, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, no, no, I was listening. No. Yeah. Uh, if you and Annette were in the time, same time zone, we could get you together and work on both your dreams at the same time, you know? <laughs> yeah, for the poor and uh, getting everything and <laughs> right, <laughs> whatever right. it was. <laughs> Great. Well, yeah, just fascinating. I mean, even the approach of, you know, working with rheumatism as an archetype, I just find that fascinating. Yeah. You know, that might no, but be... that is uh, that is a, a massively fascinating, and it's been 
it's kind of groundbreaking work to think of illness in this way. Although Mindel, I think his name is, the dream buddy, yes, he, he works but like that. Really fascinating. But, and, that would be lovely. Yeah. And I came to his work 20 years ago or something. And I sort of, inter but you can only take so much like an onion, you know, a little bit at a time, and then you return to it. But it seems that something is going on at a deeper level round about the last sort of year with, in terms of understanding some very unconscious mechanisms. But um, yeah, I've been in therapy or in analysis with the same psychoanalysis, the psychoanalyst from London since I was 26. And so that was 96. And with the purpose of looking, amongst other things, on these issues. Oh, just beautiful. You know, that reminds me of a, you know, it's a really long article. It might have been in the New Yorker called, uh, I think it was called The Long Journey. And it was about, you know, a graduate Jungian student who, you know, took therapy from, uh, you know, a woman that was farther along the program. And then, you know, continued for like the next 30 or 40 years. I don't know if anyone else remembers that or not, but that's, that's what it reminds me of. So, you know, so on the first Sunday, hopefully we'll do this next time. You know, I mean, the, on the first Sunday of the month. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, we just kind of bring up things that, you know, that are close to our heart. Maybe you could go into it more then. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, it is, a, it's up now and... Yeah, with the work that we are reading, then I think it's very interesting. Yeah. So thank you for your Arnold thoughts. Mendel had, if you ever read, uh, he, had the, he has had more weird things happen to him in his life. I mean, some of the stories he tells are just unbelievable. Amazing, the, yeah. Yeah, the synchronistic occurrences. Yeah, I have just, them all uh, the time. Yeah. So it's really it's, it's really nice to sort of read it again and and sort of constellate, if you like, consciously what it is that is going on because uh, it can be quite a, uh, a double-edged sword to navigate when things happen in the outside at the same time as inside. It's like, you know, you can often, uh, if, if you're not so um, practiced, it can become very much a question of how sane one is. Mm. Um, but the way he goes into symptoms has helped me so, so, so much. Uh, I haven't been able to sort of completely rid myself, but over and over again, I've been able to release very deep stiffness and pain. Um, so it is definitely a way there that I think is unexplored, you know, by uh, really sort of- fascinating. That's totally fascinating. You'll have to share it with us. <laughs> yeah. Yes, what was the name again? Mendel, Arnold Mendel. Yeah, I have a, a couple of his books. I'll I'll, I'll send out. Uh, I, I do. I have one right now. But but, Craig uh, sent out the Dream yeah. Buddy not so long ago. Actually, that's the one I've read as well. I don't think I've read others of his, but it's very good. Yeah, it's called I'll the Dream the Body. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah, a lot on YouTube. Chat. There's a lot on YouTube of him. He gives interviews on YouTube and he explains mm -hmm. his method and everything. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, he is at, it, you, you have to hear him, him just tell anecdotes because some of the things that has happened to him, I mean, this is kind of, I think why he, 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 he knows that synchronicity works because he's just like, it, it, I mean, everywhere he goes, uh, synchronistic events just occur like this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a they're, they're very not fascinating. Fake either. They are absolutely crazy. Mm. All right. Um, Angelic, do you uh, have any comments for us? I was going to say, too, Angelica, you came in a late. If you want to just tell us what you've been up to this last week, that'd be good, too. All right. Um... I'm not sure if I have, um, you were just discussing story nine, uh, chapter nine? Yes. Yeah. With the ravens chapter and nine, the swans, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, I was, um, I, had, I had read quite a bit of Jung, but not so much of Louis von Franz. So, because um, I, I used to find it quite um, 
strange to, I couldn't connect with her, whereas now it felt quite different. I went back to um, the unions, according to Gerard Dorn and Jungs, and there seemed to be three, the union mentalis, the union corporalis, and then the connection with the unus mundus. Um, and um, I didn't have the time to read a bit about the Unio Corporalis. Uh, a student of von Franz, Remo Roth, uh, who lives in Switzerland, has, a, has a, a blog, a kind of a website. And he seems to imply that for Jung, um, Jung did not, um, according to him, he was not as, um, into the union corporalis, where the spirit and the psyche um, get into the matter. I seem to be very interested in my work about the union corporalis more than the union mentalis, which I agree with him that Jung, Jung has extensively written about. So the union corporalis, for Gerard Dorn, my understanding is it is a necessary stage before the the connection with the anima mundi you know with the uncreated world um, um so i was very impressed by quite a few of the things um she was writing um i i had a couple of thoughts about the i don't know if, the, if this is the right time to say but a couple of thoughts of the finger um, which is, is left as a wink uh, and is sacrificed according to her. Um, bones. Sorry? You, are, are you talking about the bone that uh, is a key? Or no, go ahead. You, uh, I'm sorry, Andrew. Yes, about the, the finger of, the, of one of the swans, you know, yeah. who is not quite redeemed, but then keeps a wing. Oh, uh, a wing, yes, a wing, yes. That's beautiful. Um, Yes, so um, I, I wasn't, I didn't experience it that way, the way she was describing it, although I felt it resonated with me with the, the idea of the sacrifice. But then I quite liked what she was saying about having one foot in one world and another in another. Um, um, I am teaching on the back here of Euripides at, at uh, the last month and will for the next few months. And um, there is, there's a point where um, Pentheus, um, having been sort of prepared for his self-sacrifice by Dionysus for his dismemberment by his mother, um, he sees two sons. And I then you know, my, my thoughts were that, again, there is this sense of two worlds, but to me, it doesn't necessarily have a, a negative connotation. Mm, I find it interesting. I find interesting the possibility that there is a stage reached in, we, in which the suffering is great, but one can have access, can have glimpses in both world, worlds. Um, and also can make sort of karmic connections. One can see clearer through one's actions and, and the consequences of these actions. I'm very interested on that. Um, um, exploring, exploring my client's dreams, it, it's not a kind of a stable stage. You can't stay there for too long, but sometimes in one's journey, the, the, this sort of insight can come and it's it can be quite um there's it, it, it uh, my experience is and also observing other people's dreams in mind that there's a lot of suffering involved but there's also greater there's also a compensation of greater insight uh when this is taking place so yes i wonder if this brother was a lucky one uh, as opposed to how she presents it. That's what I thought. He was the lucky one. You uh, thought, and, yes. You know, you know, and Wotan loses an eye, and then von Franz tells 
a story about someone who escapes from some witches uh, on his horse. But the, but right as he was about to leave her land, the wolves uh, uh, take one leg of his horse. So so it's the idea of if if you go into the unconscious, something is left there, which now you can. Uh, oh, Azim, you have a. Uh, I'm sorry, Azim, go ahead. That was great, Anjali. Thank you. No, I was thinking. Um... When Andrew Dick was talking, I was thinking that sensation was Jung's uh, inferior function. Mm -hmm. That's why he went to Bollinger and started um, making uh, things with his hands. Um, so, and, and at that time, particularly, it was, um, I think in our time, it's becoming a cutting edge understanding that um, it's enough ascending, we have to go back in a different way to nature and um, just um, the physical aspect of what you were talking about. And about mirroring the inside and outside, uh, that's the state of magician. And as you know, in alchemy, they say um, as above, so below. So it's also as right, so left, and as within, so without. So everything is mirroring. They're just the same. And in synchronicity, I have an article, I can send it to you about um, synchronicity that these days people are talking that synchronistic events happen when we um, are focused on something or we create it with our mind. Actually, synchronistic events come from psychic, which is a state I don't know what it is, but it's under collective unconscious. So all these winds, these um, stars, they come from psychic and they have a voice in our, inside us as a thought. I'm thinking about something and they have an echo on another aspect outside, which is I open the, uh, I turn on the TV and it's talking to that thought. And synchronicity is a really complicated issue these days, whatever, two things happen at the same time. So, oh, it's synchronicity. Synchronicity is not that. It's too complicated. At some point, Jung debunked um, six events and um, that happened at the same time to him. And he um, came to this conclusion that it wasn't synchronicity. So it's not as easy as people uh, think about it these days. And I also have a question about this uh, bone, finger bone. I don't know what it is. Can anybody talk about it? Did, did we, oh. uh, thank you, Azine and Angelique. That was wonderful. I mean, you're always full of uh, great thoughts. I, I, you know, I'm just thinking about what does it mean for Osiris to leave uh, 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 his creative member in uh, somewhere else? I mean, we're, the, the idea is if you go into the depths and leave something there, uh, that's there and it's still you, but I don't know. I think that's positive like you thought. Well, anyway, did we miss anybody, Gary? No, uh, yeah, unless Dawn has something to say, but she generally doesn't. Okay. Well, it was a great session and uh, uh, I, I wanna thank everybody. Nazine, you're, or uh, Angelique too, if you're uh, ever wanna just, um, present uh, what you're presenting elsewhere, uh, just, you know, we uh, feel free. We'll schedule, schedule it. Just, I just have this question, if anybody has uh, something to tell about this. Uh, I have this question about finger bone, that the yeah. finger that in six swans and seven ravens. Also, yeah. in the woman who became spider, I'm thinking about the meaning, um, or representation of the big house and small house yes. and circling around the houses. Does yes. anybody have any idea about what those are? I know that the big house is moon palace. Yeah. But the little house, I don't know what it is and what well, does circles it mean? around it four times. And uh, yeah, that Big was house. pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, well, let's uh, let's try to pick that up next time. I'm I, I, we're a little bit over right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, well, uh, we will, but let, let's talk about the, uh, the finger bone. I don't think we've got to it yet, or we might've skipped it, but we won't skip it.
So <laughs> anyway, thank you everybody. And uh, it's just, uh, it was wonderful. I mean, this, these last uh, 45 minutes are always so good. So we'll see Thanks, you next uh, uh, time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.